Welcome to another episode of the Fashion Masters Podcast. My name is Quinn Castling. I'm the VP of Block Therapy, and this is, of course, Deanna Hansen, the founder of Block Therapy. And today we're going to be talking about the most common area of chronic pain in the body. And this is the low back. And it's not just chronic, but acute pain. It can typically start with acute pain or other issues, which we will be talking about in this podcast. So this is going to be really interesting because how many people do you know that they experience back pain, they go seek help, and then they get their back worked on and pay it feels great, but does it really get you anywhere? Unfortunately, the answer is no. That doesn't mean you can't work on the low back or any areas within the back, but that's not your primary concerns. Remember, there's always a cause to the pain, which we'll be talking about. So let's start off with how do you see Deanna or why do you think the low back is the most common area in the body to have chronic pain? Great question, Quinn. And so one of the reasons I see is because literally between the ribs and the pelvis, the only thing that's not even solid, but bone is the spine. So we have this whole area in our core that we need to support from a postural perspective. Otherwise, we're going to be manipulated by the limbs. Gravity is going to be pulling us forward and down, rotating us, twisting us, doing all of these things. So we have these amazing foundations in the body that are here to support proper cell alignment. But if we don't adhere to what those are, then we literally are being manipulated under the force of gravity. And, you know, like whenever I'm looking at full body assessments, it's always the calves and the feet that I look at first because that's the foundation. So if the foundation is off, as we know, everything up the chain is off. And even more so than that, when the foundation is off and we end up twisting as we do, and we'll talk further about this in a moment, but that shortening of the front of the body also pulls the rib cage forward and down. So basically this core area is getting squeezed from the foundation as well as from the top and manipulated as a result of that. So there's congestion and chaos inside. So it's kind of like you're collapsing and folding forwards because this is a weak point. So the top is collapsing down and then the lower part is getting so twisted it can throw the pelvis off as well. So you're kind of sandwiching the core, collapsing the space in the front, causing that pain in the back. That's a great way to put it. And I mean, just even on the smallest scale, not the smallest scale, but like even between the discs, you know, we can have bulging of the discs. So it's, it's just a smaller version of what you just said. Things are getting sandwiched and manipulated and, and we're losing that internal space, which again, we know creates adhesions and blocks blood and oxygen flow. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned in um, one of my YouTube videos recently, I was just showing you this before. It's like, if you see a tall building and the roof is off level, you don't look at the roof to say, oh, this issue is caused with the roof. That doesn't make any sense. It's a foundation issue where the structures all the way up the chain to the roof are now off center. And that could be by a degree, a few degrees, or by many degrees. Kind of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's like, how is that even still even standing? But, okay, so now we talked about why that's pretty well the main area. So if, let's say you have a, a severe patient that's coming in, not a patient where you're going to be working on them, but you're going to give them a block therapy protocol or some sort of protocol to help them with their pain. What is the first thing you're going to have them do? Well, the first thing that we're going to have them do is tap into their breath because until they turn that beautiful mechanism on, they aren't the healing machine that they possibly can be inside. As soon as we start breathing diaphragmatically, again, we move the toxins out, we pull more oxygen in. And that helps to inflate those spaces of collapse. So we really endeavor to make sure that that's the first thing that we always teach people to do. Now, having said that, because we already mentioned about that forward collapse of the rib cage and how that man manipulates the back, when we focus on the core and the ribs first, we also get that release of that forward pull. So right away, even though we're not addressing the foundation as a starting point, we are lightening the load on that low back. Mm. And that's hugely important because as soon as we feel that lightness and that increase in breath, then we also have an ability to navigate pain in a completely different way, which is very important, especially when people are in such, you know, distress from chronic or acute pain, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've worked with some really, really crazy cases. One of our, one of our members who is now in our teacher program, remember we did a YouTube video on this, uh, Lisa, 
when she had hit that ice wall oh, yeah. on her sled. I think she was going 80 miles an hour and she literally broke her body. She'd fractured her femur, her wrist, broke ribs, had a concussion. They didn't think she was going to live. So her whole body was riddled mm -hmm. with pain. But it was amazing to work with her as she released the old patterns and rebuilt her body. Another woman who I communicate with regularly from our community, um, she was in her 70s when she started with this process and she had completely degenerated discs in her back and she didn't think she was ever going to be able to move as she did when she was younger. And she's basically rebuilt her body. So fascinating what we can do at any age, even with these extreme things. But after we focus on that breath, then we have to look at that foundation because just as you said, we're not going to fix the roof by addressing the roof. We need to look at what's causing those things. And the fascia is so fascinating in how it continually is in motion, constantly adapting to the forces put on our body. So amazing, like even if we sprain that ankle and we start limping, if we've been limping or walking with crutches for a couple of weeks, how that manipulates everything up the chain is so incredibly impactful. I remember once when I was on a holiday and I was going for long walks and I had sandals on and I got a blister on my toe. And then for about, I don't know, an hour as I had to walk back, I was somewhat compensating. The next day, my whole body was sore from that compensating. So whenever I look at any bodies, I'm always looking first at what's going on in the foundation. And after we get that breath going, then we're going to start to release and rebuild, release and rebuild. Obviously, we can't just release it all in one shot and, you know, get people to become strong in correct alignment. It's a process. And we want to take those daily steps so that we create a release from the foundation, and then we start to strengthen. We have a series called the Pronator Corrector Series, and actually just this week we launched part two of that. I think this is probably one of the most impactful things that we have in our membership because hmm. it teaches people to realign the feet and bring strength into what carries our whole body going forward. Most people have a flat tire. They, they basically they're pronating, the arches have collapsed, the feet have spread apart, there's twisting, they might have bunions, toes might be, you know, stuck together instead of being able to spread apart really strongly. So when we have these manipulations in the feet, we can even be working on the calves and if we haven't addressed the feet because they are the most frozen every step we take. Again, we draw our bodies back into that negative fascia pattern. And it's interesting because it is like a car and a flat tire. If you have a flat, even a, let's say your tire pressure needs to be like 38 and then it's at 28. You can drive around for a day, maybe a week, and there's going to be no consequences to the vehicle. But if you drive around with a, a low tire or a flat tire for a month, many months or a year, that's going to cause issues to your vehicle and your alignment. And you're going to have to get the whole vehicle realigned. So it's kind of like a similar analogy in a way. Yeah. And I mean, if you are driving with a flat tire, you can even feel the pull of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. the car into that space where you might have to now hold the wheel yeah. because you're constantly fighting that. Yeah, 100%. I, I love using the analogy of walking a dog because my sister has a really large dog. She's always had big German, German shepherds. shepherds. Yeah. And um, so, you know, walking a 110 pound animal on a leash that's really controlled walking beside you, not tugging on your arm. That's one thing, but you have a dog that's huge and whipping at you, you know, like your, your body's going to continually get pulled into a system. So the equal and opposite side of the, of that system is going to have to counter that pull mm -hmm. so you don't land on your face. So that's where the back of the body comes in because we keep falling in a forward rotational direction. And then the muscles in the opposite side in the back are having to splint themselves to stop us from tipping over right. and that's where we tend to have the pain so whether it's your piriformis or sciatic pain or your si joint or the discs inside all of that is going to be manipulated by what's going on in the foundation and another thing to note i think if somebody let's say is now in chronic pain it's how did you get there or can you like almost backtrack when the first little like blow kind of happened or when was the first time where you felt that pain or that tension and when did it get really bad and and what do you do what are your hobbies so for some people it could be i golf four days a week 
okay, well now you're hunched over on a ball. Maybe your alignment isn't correct and you're swinging in one direction all the time. Or I'm a tennis player. I'm swinging in one direction all the time. Or maybe you're just sitting on the couch being and you're too sedentary and you're just not moving. And then over time from the compression and laying on maybe one side of the body, like what Gramps used to do, like he was like a C all the time. Literally a C. Yeah. So I, I think we, that's another big thing to consider and to understand is how did you get there? Cause I know like I've experienced back pain before, but I used to also bodybuild and I used to throw very heavy weight around. And I know that I wasn't in correct alignment because all I cared about was getting the weight from A to B as many reps as I can until failure. And that's all I really knew at a young age. And then I realized, wow, I've created so much tension in my back. This is terrible. And I wasn't conscious of my feet. I wasn't conscious of how my knees are in relation to my feet, how my hips are in relation to everything else. So we really have to view this, how everything's stacked on top of each other, because yes, you mentioned the first thing is access the breath properly. So Make sure that your diaphragm is aligned, but also make sure that your pelvis is aligned so that the diaphragm and the pelvic floor is parallel to each other in some sort of sync. Because as soon as you have an anterior pelvic tilt or too much of a posterior pelvic tilt, then your rib cage is going to reflect that. And then your shoulders, and then your head and your neck, then maybe the knees. But it, one of the biggest things I remember you telling me um, a long, not a long time ago, but whenever you did, hyperextending the knees is one of the biggest causes or potential causes of back pain because you're, or that's one of the biggest cues you can do to fix things or at least steer yourself in the right direction. Because as soon as you hyperextend the knees, you're likely standing with your feet out like a duck and your pelvis is going to tilt in that anterior pelvic alignment. And now you're causing too much of that compression in the low back. And now you're, you're going to have some sort of like hyphosis going on or something. And then you're having to overcompensate. It's just your body is so brilliant on how it's trying to adapt and create balance and harmony. It's really smart. Like the the body's trying its best and the fascia is trying its best just to stay upright. But you can't really fix any of that until you really address the feet and then the knees and then the pelvis, then the diaphragm, even though we address the diaphragm, then everything else up the chain. So even for people sitting here listening, if you're sitting in a chair, notice the sit bones. Are the sit bones, is, is there equal weight on both sit bones? Because likely somebody's going to feel there's a little more pressure on one side than the other. And then where's your foundation? Are your knees bent at 90 degrees or greater? Because if you have them tucked under a chair, you're going to be twisting and manipulating the pelvis. Or do you sit cross-legged with one leg over all the time? That's going to be manipulating the mm-hmm. pelvis. So we want to, when we're sitting, this is a really good thing because, I mean, we're always going to be sitting at some point in the day, so we might as well learn how to sit properly. So, you know, having something behind your back to give you that prompt to sit up straight is great, but what is going on in the foundation here? Because we don't want to collapse in and squish everything. So that in itself is such a great thing to focus on. And yes, when we're standing, it is so common to hyperextend the knees because when we're not thinking about supporting our body with our muscles, we end up hyperextending and twisting, but twisting in different directions. Again, we've got the flat tire pulling the body away, and then we have the equal and opposite side counterbalancing, going into an anchoring stance. Mm -hmm. And that creates a manipulation of the fascia around the shin bones and a manipulation at the ankle. So whether one foot is pronating, both feet are pronating, one is going to be more so, and then the other one is going to be, again, counterbalancing that pull. So again, it's like we have a war going inside, going on inside of the body. Mm -hmm. And when you translate the proper alignment of the, of the feet and how that would look in the pelvis where the hip joints are, as soon as the feet fall out of alignment and there's all this tracking away from midline, those hip joints connected obviously to the feet are going to be manipulated. And we're going to have a squeezing of the contents inside the pelvis and a rotation and a twisting. So even for people that have things like um, uh, women's, women's pain with like their cycle or something, um, inflammation, bloating, if we've had scar tissue, like C-sections, all of these things in the front that that seem to be in the front of the body, it's basically in the same area, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's in this core space that doesn't have that ability to keep us stacked with bones correctly. So we have a manipulation of everything. I remember, um, I used to suffer a lot with constipation and when I was constipated, I had back pain. 
And then when I finally would do a cleanse or something and I would release all that waste out of my body, suddenly my back didn't hurt anymore. Mm. And it was because of all that amazing pressure in the core mm. that was also putting pain into the back. Mm. So there's so many components mm -hmm. when we are addressing the back. And that's why really what we want to do is we want to align and detoxify. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as we do that, as soon as we release that fascia pattern, no matter what it is, you know, even things like spondylolithesis or ankylosing spondylosis, like these are, these are things where the vertebrae get either with ankylosing spondylitis, there's inflammation of the vertebrae and then it can be, there could be a fusion of that, mm -hmm. um, which is a freezing of that because of a lack of energy in the area or the spondylolithesis where the vertebrae actually slip off of each other. Mm -hmm. But what's driving that? Mm -hmm. It's the foundation. Mm -hmm. Because it's, as you said, like think of that roof. If there's going to be a slippage of something, it's because we don't have that pelvis stacked in proper alignment. And when I, we were working, remember Zen, and I um, just, just love the Zen and story mm -hmm. because, again, he was our six-year-old with uh, scoliosis. And it was fascinating because it was a journey to get Zen and his body back to a correct alignment. But the very first thing that we did was we addressed his foundation. So he had x-rays prior to working, and then he had x-rays after we had started this journey. And it was, it was interesting because as we were talking with the parents, there was a moment when the curve actually looked worse in the spine. And that was all that was really looked at and shared with the family was that things are getting worse. But when you actually tracked down and you looked at the alignment of the pelvis in the before picture, the pelvis was way off. And then in the second x-ray, the pelvis was level and balanced so that twisting was undoing itself mm -hmm. up the chain. But if we don't look at the full body, things might look worse when they're actually not worse. There's just a journey and a process to yeah. bringing everything into balance. And we can't correct what's going on in the center of the body without correcting the limbs. Mm -hmm. And even just touching on what you said earlier about if there's a lot of internal pressure that can cause pain. I noticed a big difference when I was doing the cleanses too, where it's not like I'm in back pain, but it's, it was just, it's, it's kind of like when you feel a relief of anxiety when you didn't even think you had anxiety, but you're just like, wow, I'm just like a level calmer. Yeah. I felt that with like my low back. I'm like, oh, my back is just a level calmer. And it's not as like, I guess, chronically kind of tight, not saying that it was, but it just felt better. Um, so that's also tracking back because that this was so important about Zenin. Because if you didn't know this about Zenin, this he could have kept on pulling his body back into the scoliosis. And that's because he was um, doing archery. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Doing archery. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, but you're pulling this bow in the same direction for however many times or hours a day he was doing this. And he's young. He's still growing and developing. So you've talked a lot about that when you're out of alignment when you're young or you're in front of a computer and you're slouched over whatever the issue is when you're still growing that can be even worse of an issue than if you were fully developed and then you develop some sort of ailment or pain or etc so that's why it's really important that and really smart that you found out okay well, like what are your hobbies what do you do he's like oh well i like practice archery like every day for x amount of time so it's the same thing with golf or with whatever the person is doing. If they're rotating all the time in one direction, you have to also balance your pelvis, your entire spine. I was going to say your thoracic spine, but your entire spine, make sure that the rotation is proper. Do tests to see how far is your rotation to the right? How far is it to the left? And that alone isn't going to fix the issue because you need to re release the connective tissue. So the biggest thing is a fascia decompression technique that we do, which is, of course, block therapy. And that's going to be the winning ticket to release the pain or release the adhesions to improve the flow and to take the pressure off of where other, wherever the pressure is. But if you continue to perform your habits that have caused you this, you're only going to go back in. So that's why it's so important to start strengthening the body from the micro foundations to become like a full body strong unit that can be aligned, that can be mobile in all directions. And you don't have to be perfect to get out of pain. You don't have to say, oh, my range of motion to the left and to the right, my thoracic mobility is identical. I'm not saying that's the case. You just have to get there enough so that you're not in the pain anymore. 
Okay. So what are your thoughts on this? Cause there are some people that do get results doing this, but it's a ridiculous amount of core exercises or crunches a day to help with their back pain. So I've, I've talked to people where they've said, this is the only thing that's saving them. And if I stop it even for a day or I don't know, maybe that's exaggerated or for a week, like my back will go out. What are your thoughts on that? Whenever we're doing extras to stabilize an area, if we aren't looking full body and creating that alignment, then basically they might be out of pain, but they might have now limited mobility. So, I mean, it's one thing if I want to go in my full range of motion without pain, but if I'm like, okay, like I'm, I'm in so much pain, if I do these crazy crunches, maybe I can move in a smaller range of motion without pain, but to be able to go to the full range of our potential may not be accessible to them. I used to do 400 sit-ups a day. <laughs> so my goal was to get, you know, a nice flat belly, which actually made me bigger because what I did was I shortened the front of my body through that constant repetitive mm. concentric contraction. And it just created more constipation, more inflammation in my gut. It caused me more pain in my low back. So when people do this, maybe long-term, uh, it's not going to be the right answer for them because again, they're, they're not looking at the full body and maybe they don't walk around much. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe they're really sedentary. I'm not really sure. I'd have to have more information on that, but, um, it, it's one thing to stabilize and to strengthen around an area. But again, if we don't have a foundation that supports it, it's only a matter of time when something's going to give and something's going to Yeah, give. I, I can totally see that. Like if you were to get away with doing the core exercise and that's been helping you stay out of back pain for a year, a couple of years, a few years, whatever the time is, there's eventually going to be a breaking point. There's going to be a point where A, you just don't really have the strength to even do that you're, you're probably going to get lazy in the future and you're completely dependent on core exercises whereas why don't you just release what's actually causing that and this i'm surprised we didn't even mention this but like the balloon analogy this is this is a typical block therapy analogy when it comes to either back pain or even we use it for compression and ballooning for fat cells etc but if you have a half-filled balloon you squeeze one end, the opposite end is going to get bigger and more inflamed and that's the low back. It's that inflamed, painful area, the expanded part of the balloon. But what caused that is, of course, the grip onto that balloon. So you have to address the grip. So now I'm just thinking if you're doing more crunches, you're just strengthening that grip, no? Yes. So, uh, and that's it. And, you know, I mean, I was a Highland dancer growing up. I started at the age of seven. I quit when I was 17. And so I very strongly created a turnout on purpose, I stood like a duck because that was the dance, right? And so all of the actions and motions were done with this posture, which shortened my hip flexors because when you stand that way, it's an indication your hip flexors are shortened, but it completely manipulated my back. And so to that mm -hmm. question about, you know, the strengthening, yes, you can have benefit from strengthening, but you always used to say to me when, when you were young, um, because I would, you know, like I, I can do crazy things strength wise. I can hold up a 300 pound person on my legs for 20 minutes and, and not fatigue. And you would always say it's because you have such strong inside muscles. Mm -hmm. So if you're strengthening those external muscles and that's where you're focused and we're not focused on the diaphragm and the breathing and, and the other internal muscles to focus on them, we're creating basically an armor mm -hmm. and that armor mm -hmm. might protect you but it also might limit you. I mean, think of wearing armor, like you, you don't have that freedom and flexibility. I, I often think of um, that uh, analogy, like uh, Bruce Lee, you know, he's, he can go up against really big, huge guys and beat them because he has mobility and strength. Where if you got somebody like, you know, uh, the, the Hulk, for example, I mean, he might be big. And if you happen to get in his right- Or the Rothy. The or, or the actual Hulk. Whoever. Okay. So some big, big dude. Some big dude. Yeah. <laughs> if if you get in his way, he can crunch you. But I mean, because he's so big and burly, he might not have that mobility that somebody yeah. like a, a Bruce Lee would have. And and who's going to win? Um, if you're faster than the big guy, you can probably, you know, Escape run that. around in circles. And he, uh, he also had incredible, it's either pronounced like key or chi. I've heard different ways of pronouncing that. But because he knew how to breathe. Right. That's why and he knew how to like channel his energy in, in such a 
powerful way. All through the breath, though. And that's where that's chi is breath. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's life force. As soon as we die, we have no breath. We have no life force. Mm. And the diaphragm moves the life force energy throughout the body. Mm. So if we have a shallow breath, we have a limited amount of life force running through our body because we don't have that engine to circulate it to all of the cells. Yeah, that's wild. So pretty well, what we've talked about is you need to A, address the cause, which is going to be the fascia, but also specific areas in the fascia and the foundation, the breath and the foundation. Then we need to strengthen. So people are probably wondering, well, what ratio should I be doing this? Like how often should I be strengthening? So what if somebody is an avid fitness person? They, they like going to the gym. They don't just weight train, but they like to do different kind of stuff. Maybe it's going to be more of an aerobic uh, exercise. Other times it is a weight training. Other times it might be a boot camp or it might just be on the stair climber for 30 minutes a day. So what would you tell that person who is in back pain that is open to doing fascia decompression or block therapy to help with their back pain? What would that person, let's just say it's me, what should I do for my fitness regimen? Or what would you almost like tell them to do? Should you say, hey, you should maybe take a break and just like shed off all this tension that's causing it? Or or what's your perspective on that? Well, a great question and a lot of variables there to sort of address because everybody's going to be individual. But one of the things I learned as an athletic therapist was if you're going to be rehabbing an injury, isometric training is the safest and the most efficient at gaining strength back. Because when you're doing isometric resistance, you're not falling into a pattern of a groove. You're holding, you're breathing, you're integrating the cells around in a, in a way to strengthen. So that's what we do. We teach people to isometrically strengthen their body in correct alignment after they've created a release. So if somebody's open and they have a lot of restriction as pretty much anybody does starting out before they've done this, I would say if you're open to it, you know, take the first month off where you're not in the gym, you're not doing those repetitive exercises that you've been doing because we want to change your patterning of your fascia. So if you can, it would be wonderful if you can release. And then every day when we have people going through a guided program, we have an alignment training piece because that's the hardest part. We want to create proper habits with foundation. And it doesn't mean we have to go and do a lot of physical work, but even just becoming aware. So whether we're sitting with our knees 90 degrees and we suddenly squeeze that block for a few minutes to increase the strength of the adductors, that is going to help your core. Because again, if your limbs are all wonky and moving in different directions, now will be your core. And then the psoas is going to get involved and I mean, and so on and so on. So I would always say to somebody starting out, take a break from what you've been doing because there's no point if you're in this point where you want to actually create change, there's no point in doing what you've been doing because then you're just going to be fighting what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. We want to take that moment, release, rebuild from that conscious perspective. Once you feel that you're in a new position with your alignment and your pain and whatever's going on in your body, then go back and be conscious of being in the gym now because now you've learned things. So even if you're doing a bicep curl, if you're winging your body because you're lifting weight that's too hard, you're going to be using you know momentum instead of proper strength. So changing how we work out, it's not, we don't want to work out. I mean, of course we want to, if you want to go to the gym and you want to lift weight, that's great, but do it in a conscious way. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, then you're just going to, again, your limbs are going to be manipulating everything in the core. So if you go and you work your legs and your arms and you don't have that understanding of proper alignment, you're just going to be creating more problem mm -hmm. down the road. And another big misconception, I think, well, at least I had, <clears throat> was if you have back pain, you should never even strengthen the back or really work on the back. And again, I think that's case to case. But like if you're in chronic pain, I'm not going to really tell you to be doing much when it comes to mobility, maybe some very minor movements, but just focus on the block, focus on releasing. Can I can I jump in here? Just because again, that, that one case I was mentioning in the beginning where a woman had degenerative disc disease in her low back and she would never go into those um, back extensions or twists. She's doing them now with no issue whatsoever. And again, she she didn't start at the age of 30. I believe she was in her 70s when she began this. She was mm -hmm. retired already. And so now she can do pretty much anything that I can do on those videos. Mm -hmm. She's been blocking for, I think, over three years, though. 
So okay. she's put her time in and she's done it. But she again, did she, she did the work, but she rebuilt a body that she thought was basically done. Mm -hmm. And she now is as lively and youthful as she was even before, like when she was in her 30s. Like she goes camping, she goes hiking, she does all these things. And there's nothing limiting her at all anymore. She's not afraid to lift something or to do some kind of mm. movement where before she's like, wow, if I, you know, tried to do any kind of rotation, it could put her back out and send her into a frenzy of pain. Mm -hmm. So she has control of her body now. And she's literally, this is the exciting part because she's literally rebuilt it. It's not just that she's released the old patterning. She had no discs and now she's able to do these yeah, things that she didn't think she would ever be able to do before. Yeah, that's so incredible. So yeah, that that's why I think, of course, you have to go through the process. You have to obviously start with releasing. I love doing the release strength and release strengthen. But again, that can be case per case. I don't want to sound extremely redundant, but I found it amazing how much better my back started feeling when I started actively working on my back. Because I almost, and sorry, I don't mean like I would still work my back out like crazy, but it was like the typical lap pull down, chin ups, barbell rows, dumbbell, rows, whatever it is, right? Just like a classic bodybuilding workout. But when I started really focusing on more of like the intricate muscles and more muscles that need to be firing when they're not, when you're not conscious, because if you're just going to the gym, you're not warm. You don't even know if you have the right muscles warmed up. You're just throwing weight around. And it's like, I'm hoping the right muscles fire up at the right time, but you might not really know. You're going to say something. Yeah, I just, I have a great example of this because I was in the Iyengar yoga teacher training 20 some years ago. And so we would have these advanced classes and we would go and we were all advanced in our yoga practice. So the goal was to kind of get to the extended version of that position. So whether it's the splits or whether it's, you know, the back bends or, or you know, so it, it was fascinating because my teacher wanted me to join her when she was having a class for people that had um, disability. So most of the work was done in a chair. So I was going through this class with her and it was fascinating because, you know, we'd be sitting in correct alignment and we would be doing very minimal movement, but to the range that we could. So I remember there was this one where we, you know, got to beside the chair, but we were very conscious of our foundation. And then we would turn and we would hold isometrically. I was more sore from that class hmm than I was from any of the advanced classes where I was trying to put my body into these pretzel type shapes because I didn't have the integration. I was, I was losing foundations to try to get somewhere as opposed to really understanding my body to support building it from that correct space. Mm. So that was such an eye opener for me. And I remember I called her the next day and I said, I have to tell you, I am the most sore from this class. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, because I was so conscious of every single action and movement and not necessarily every single cell in that moment, but I was, again, I was way more in my body because I wasn't trying to get to some end point. It was all about that internal, those, those, you know, smaller integrated muscles that were doing the work. And it was fascinating. Yeah, I. That's hilarious that you said uh, that. That was a, like a core rotation, thoracic rotation, mm -hmm. something along those lines. Well, that's, same thing. Like what I'm working on. Like I'm still working through little things. Um, I'm sure we always will be. But it's so easy to see somebody say, "Hey, do ten thoracic rotations to your right. Exhale on the rotation. Inhale, come back to neutral. Right, and then do ten on the left, etc." Cool. But what if you were to do one to three, but you were to hold it for five to 10 breaths and go really, really slow, feel it, feel that end range. Now protract the shoulder blade, now push away, now try to rotate more, feel what's going on and actually breathe through that and be conscious of it. The results you will get doing it that way compared to just winging out 10 repetitions on each side is exponentially different. And I, I can't believe it. Like, just doing that before I, I do a bigger back workout. I always start with mobility before I train really anything in the gym. And that's something that I only started doing fairly recent, probably within the past year or so, because I would just always do my blocking here. And then I just kind of felt ready to go, but I'm trying to explore more and learn more. And I can't believe the changes it's making. And another big reason why 
um, muscles can be tight is because there's the instability in a joint. So this is where I do believe the strengthening component is important. When there's an instability in a joint, the muscles are going to kind of go into a bit of a spasm trying to protect that joint because it's not, it's not strong yet. So that's why it's important to actually strengthen the muscles in the back and all surrounding muscles. And I know you mentioned this to me recently too. It's like, you need to strengthen if you can pretty well every muscle in your body. You want every muscle to have its full range of motion. Not saying that it's like that possible, but if you're going to generalize it into different muscle groups, make sure that it has the strength and the mobility and that there's not crazy adhesions in the way. And you'll feel that. Like you'll feel the adhesions, the blockages when you're doing any exercises, if you're conscious enough, you're like, wow, I can feel that is a huge restriction. That's starting to cramp. Well, don't avoid the cramp, stay with the cramp, breathe through the cramp. And now, you know, that's also an area you do want to release a lot of the tension because it's not just the muscle that's saying, Hey, there's instability in the joint. I'm going to tighten up. It's also the fascia. A lot of the time when you're sore from working out, it's, it's not the muscle, it's actually the fascia. But remember, I mean, muscle is made up of fascia. Like there's nothing that's not. So it's always the fascia. Yeah. You can never not have the fascia involved. And the fascia being the combination of primarily the elastin and the collagen, that's what gives us both the mobility and the stability. Mm -hmm. However, when we have those spaces of contraction that become chronic and stagnant, the collagen migrates to those spaces to try to build up that wall at the expense of that equal and opposite side that now is under this chronic stretch whose cells are pulled away from each other. So now there's less cells giving you that energy mm -hmm. and there's there's just imbalance everywhere. But your point to why you felt so good when you were slowing that whole um, rotation down and, and maybe only doing it one to three times was because again, that's that isometric stuff. Mm -hmm. we, when you're doing anything fast, we fall again into these grooves. We create these roadways, roadways in the body and the adhesions lay the tracks for the roadways. Mm -hmm. So if we just keep falling in those same patterns of movement, we keep making those tracks that much more ingrained. Yeah, that's so accurate. And we want to get into those tracks and we want to spend time there because then when we do that, now we're sending blood to where those tracks have been laid, which are the adhesions. And then we start to melt them. We're taking those tracks away and now we're finding those other cells and that other part of that muscle or tissue, whatever we're talking about, and we're bringing it into life mm -hmm. so that we can have the strength. And, you know, really it's as long as those cells are properly fed and clean, there's strength in them because it's the oxygen that feeds the ATP. Mm -hmm. So if we have those blockages, no matter what you're doing, if you're lifting a ton of weight, but you're only using 20%, maybe you've got 20% of those cells that are working super hard, but they're going to exhaust really fast in time because there's only so much life in a cell if they're being overused to that degree. So it's all about integration and that's the key. And if every single cell in your body is working, you've got full range of motion, you've got as much strength and alignment as your body could possibly have. And that's really the goal and the focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I fully agree. What, what I found interesting is I posted this TikTok video. I showed you this before. And I'm like, this is the video I had the most success on. And by success, I don't mean the most amount of views or the most amount of likes or the most amount of shares or saves. It was the most amount of positive comments in the comment section saying how much it's helped them. And I believe I showed the belly position, the hip flexors position, and then kind of that like glute pop exercise up against the wall. And there might've been like one other thing, but I don't think there was, I think it was like as simple as that. So that was amazing how well that worked for people showing how to use a rolled up towel following this protocol can already help to alleviate back pain. No, I don't know. These aren't people necessarily in our community that are like avid blockers or anything. These are people that are surfing TikTok. They're in back pain. They use it as an SEO platform to find how to get out of back pain. They tried it out and they got results within like, and a lot of them were saying, this gave me immediate relief. This feels amazing. This is the best thing I've done for my back ever. Like, really, really good comments. So, and of course it would though, because again, I mean, if you think about the, the, the way that there's these cause sites and pain sites with the hip flexors, when they get gluey and they manipulate you in the front, there's that direct equal and opposite issue in your opposite SI joint and all the muscles around there that are trying to contract. So you've just released this. And now you take that moment to create stability in that space. You've given them a whole new 
understanding of their pelvis. You've lengthened the front, you've taken stress off the back, and you've given them that lateral strength, which yep. they would have been lacking if they were twisted with a frozen uh, hip flexor. A hundred percent. And strengthening the glute medius, I think, which is obviously like what you're also talking about there, but that helps really stabilize the pelvis. And for a lot of the people, for majority of people, the glute medius isn't really turned on. It's not, it's not working as much as it's, as it should. So being able to and, release. And the reason is, is because people end up using their lower back muscles. Totally. To hold their body upright instead of activating that rooting action to stabilize the pelvis. So if. As well as the glutes. Right. Because the glutes are one of, if not the biggest as in mass postural muscles for the body and the glute medius specifically to um, hold the body upright yeah so yeah there's you can see how this conversation keeps on going and going and going but that's why it's so important to put together protocols so that people can take this all into bite-sized pieces in the most quote in quote out intelligent way that we could do it so people don't have to necessarily think of, oh, should I be doing this exercise or this exercise? And sure, you want to get to that point where you feel like I need to be working more on this area. I can feel it. I can feel the weakness. I can feel the cramping. I can feel the asymmetry in a certain area. But I think that's why people in our community have so much success. Well, and, and exactly. And I mean, even just think about if you were to walk around for a month carrying a 10 pound weight in one arm, you'd be in pain. Oh, of course. You'd be tired. You'd be in pain. You could do all the strengthening that you wanted. If you were still holding on to that anchor or that weight on only one side of your body, you would be in pain. So letting that weight go is the answer, not strengthening more. Mm -hmm. We need to release what's causing yeah. the issues in the first place. Yeah. And that's the key, right? Yeah. So as soon as we do that, then again, we have the opportunity to change everything. Yeah. 100% agree. Well, is there anything else you think we should add to this episode? Just that when it comes to chronic pain, it's really important to understand the full body always, because if we go and we just address that, I mean, you've mentioned this already, but I just want to bring it home because it's so important because I'll do the same thing. If my hip is hurting, I want to lie on that block where my hip hurts because you, you want that immediate satisfaction. However, that is only going to give you that immediate satisfaction. We want the long-term solution. We want to get to the root of the problem. So we have to look at the full body. And if you don't engage the breath, even if you do address the whole body without addressing proper diaphragmatic breathing, the benefits are going to be so much less than the exponential benefits of combining both. So this is the most important muscle to strengthen, in my view, of your entire body is the diaphragm. You don't see it. That's the challenge. You don't go to the gym and say, oh, my diaphragm's looking awesome today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good looking diaphragm you got there. Right? <laughs> but that's the thing. It's everywhere. It's everywhere because it directs the breath. So um, anyway. Yeah. I think that's pretty much all I needed to add. Yeah. No, it, it's funny because as, as we keep talking, there's more things that I could keep adding on, but we can always do a part two of this in the future. So anyways. That was really cool. I think people, um, you will have a good understanding of kind of what we're talking about here and why it's so important to, yes, release the entire body. You got to release the entire body, but you can also start adding in the strength at the same time kind of thing. Um, but again, remember, it's dependent case to case, person to person, how dense you are, how twisted you are, what are your habits, how are you positioning yourself throughout the day, how's your breath, how's even, like we didn't even talk about the emotional state or anything. Um, I think I mentioned kidney infections did i mention that briefly i forget but i even heard like a lot of comments on one of my tiktoks was saying oh mine was actually a kidney infection that caused me my back pain and then they got that addressed and then boom the back pain's kind of gone so of course there's going to be cases well, like, like that the inflammation right so like any exactly, inflammation that and pressure or is going to yeah, have pressure yeah totally so there's a lot of well first of all this is a ton of information we've kind of dumped on on you but um yeah, I think a really good start if you just need some sort of help or assistance is definitely check out all like our YouTube videos. We have a ton of positions that you can obviously try out for free. Uh, go to our website, blocktherapy.com. We have the five steps to remove your pain. Is that how it's, <laughs> is that what it's called? Yes, your chronic pain. Yes, some, something along those lines. But there's free content on the website. Check that out. We also have our sampler program. It's nine bucks. 
you can get that. It's it's nine days. And if you want to explore the real deal, you can do that. It's a block therapy starter program. But other than that, just kind of test it out with the towel, see what you think. You can check out our community group on Facebook, Block Therapy Community. Type that in on the Facebook search bar and then join in. There's over 10,000 people in there now and the results people are getting are amazing. What they're sharing, the testimonials, it's just brilliant. So uh, the YouTube channel is, if you're watching this, you're on the YouTube channel. It's, I believe just at, actually it's at Fluid Isometrics, funny enough, it's not even Block Therapy. But type in Block Therapy on YouTube, you'll find us there. Um, you can also check out my channel and the combination of everything that we're doing. It's amazing what the results people are getting. So other than that, have an awesome day. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Deanna, of course. Thank you, Glenn. And we'll see you in the next episode.